Um, so yeah, this week um, obviously quite a big um, kind of quite a bit just to get get set up to get results from this week in terms of needing all of ImageNet and that kind of thing and um, getting all that working. So I know that uh, a lot of you are still working through that. Um, I did want to mention uh, a couple of reminders um, just that I've noticed. Um, one is that in general um, we have that uh, thing on the wiki about like how to use the notebooks and uh, we really strongly advise that, that you don't open up the notebook we give you and like click shift enter through it again and again. You're not really going to learn much from that. Um, but uh, go back to that wiki page, it's like the first thing that's mentioned in the first paragraph of the home page of the wiki is like how to use the notebooks. And basically the idea is try to start with a fresh notebook, think about what you think you need to do first, try and do that thing. If you have no idea, then you can go to the existing notebook, take a peek, close it again, try and re-implement what you just saw. Um, as much as possible, you know, really don't just shift enter through the notebooks. Um, and I know if some of you are doing it because there are threads on the forum saying, I was shift entering through the notebook and this thing didn't work. And somebody's like, well, that's because that thing's not defined yet. So uh, consider yourself busted. Um, all right. Um, the other thing to remind you about is that um, the goal of part two is to kind of get you to a point where you can um, read papers. And the reason for that is because you kind of know the best practices now, so anytime you want to do something beyond what we've learned, um, you're going to be kind of implementing things from papers or probably going beyond that and implementing new things. Um, reading a new paper in an area that you haven't looked at before is, at least to me, somewhat terrifying. Um, on the other hand, reading the paper for the thing that we already studied last week hopefully isn't terrifying at all, because you already know what the paper says. So I always have that in the assignments each week, is like, read the paper for the thing you just learned about, and like go back over it, and please ask on the forums if there's a bit of notation or anything that you don't understand, or if there's something we heard in class that you can't see in the paper, or particularly interesting, if you see something in the paper that you don't think we mentioned in class. Um, so that's the reason that I really encourage you to read the papers that we studied in, you know, the, where, for the topics we studied in class. Um, I think it's, for those of you like me who don't have uh, a technical academic background, it's really a great way to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the notation. And I'm actually really looking forward to some of you asking about notation on the forum so I can explain some of it to you. Like, there's a few key things that Kind of keep coming up in notation, like probability distributions and stuff like that. So please feel free, and if you're watching this later uh, in the MOOC, uh, again, um, feel free to ask on the forum anything that's not clear. Um, I was kind of interested in following up on some of last week's experiments myself, and the, the thing that kind of I think we all were a bit shocked about was, was putting this guy into the devise model and getting out more pictures of similar looking fish in, in nets. And I was kind of curious about, you know, how that was working and how well that was working. And I then completely broke things by training it for a few more epochs. And after doing that, I then did an image similarity search again, and I got these three guys who were lo no longer in nets. Um, so I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Um, and. Um, the other thing I mentioned is when I trained it where my starting point was what we looked at in class, which was just before the final bottleneck layer, I didn't get very good results from this thing. But when I trained it from st the starting point of just after the bottleneck layer, I got the good results that, that you saw. Um, and I, again, I don't know why that is, and I don't think this has been studied as far as I'm aware, so there's lots of open questions here. But I'll show you something I did then do, was I thought, well, that's interesting. I think what has happened here is that it's focus, it, it, when you train it for longer, it knows that the important thing is the fish and not the net, and it seems to be now focusing on giving us the same kind of fish. Like these are clearly the exact same type of fish, um, I guess so anyway. Um, so I started wondering how could we force it to 
combine. So I tried the most obvious possible thing. I wanted to get more fish in nets. And I typed word to vec dict tench, that's a kind of fish, plus word to vec dict net divided by two, get the average of the two word vectors, and give me the nearest neighbor. And that's what I got. Um, and then just to prove it wasn't a fluke, I tried the same on tench plus rod, and there's my nearest neighbor. Now, do you know what's really freaky about this? Um, if you Google for ImageNet categories, you'll get a list of the thousand ImageNet categories. If you search through them, neither net nor rod appear at all. Like, I, I can't begin to imagine why this works. Um, but it does. Um, so this device model is clearly doing some pretty deep magic in terms of the, the understanding of, of these objects and their relationships. That not only are we able to combine things like this, but we're able to combine it with categories that it's literally never seen before. It's, it's never seen a rod, we've never told it what a rod looks like, um, and ditto for a net. And I tried quite a few of these combinations and they just kept working. Like another one I tried was, um, now I, I understand why this works, which is I tried searching for boat. Now boat doesn't appear in ImageNet, but there's lots of kinds of boats that appear in ImageNet, so not surprisingly it figures out generally speaking, how to find boats. I didn't, I didn't, I expected that. Um, and then I tried boat plus engine, and I got back pictures of um, power boats, and then I tried boat plus paddle, and I got back pictures of, of rowing boats. Um, so there's a whole lot going on here, and I think there's lots of opportunities for you to explore and experiment um, based on the explorations and experiments that I've done. And more to the point, perhaps to create some interesting and valuable tools. You know, um, like I would have thought a tool to do a kind of an image search to say, show me all the images that contain these kinds of objects. Or better still, maybe you could start training um, with things that aren't just nouns but also adjectives. So you could start to like search for, you know, um, pictures of um, crying babies or um, flaming houses or whatever. Um, I mean, I think there's all kinds of stuff you could do with this, which would be really interesting, whether it be in your in a narrow um, kind of uh, organizational setting, or to create some new startup or new open source project or whatever. So anyway, um, lots of things to try. Um, more stuff this week. Um, I actually missed this. This wasn't this week, but I um, was thrilled to see that. Um, one of our students has written this fantastic um, Medium post, uh, Linear Algebra Cheat Sheet. I think I missed it because it was posted not to the Part 2 um, forum, but maybe to the main forum. Um, but this is really cool. Um, uh, Brendan has gone through and really explained, I think, all the stuff that I would have wanted to have known about Linear Algebra before I got started. And particularly, I really appreciate that he's um, Kind of taking a code first approach, so like how do you actually do this in, in NumPy and talking about broadcasting. So you guys will all be very familiar with this already, but for your friends who are wondering how to get started in deep learning, um, you know, what's the minimal things you need to know, it's probably the chain rule and some linear algebra. I think this covers a lot of any linear algebra pretty effectively. So thank you, Brendan. Um, oh, other things from last week. Um, Andrea Frome, who, who wrote that device paper, um, I actually emailed her and asked her what she thought I, what else I should look at, and she suggested this um, paper, Zero Shot Learning by a Convex Combination of Semantic Embeddings, which um, she's uh, only a later author on, but she says it's kind of, in some ways, a, um, you know, a more powerful version of device. It's actually quite different. Um, and I haven't implemented it myself, but you know, it's it's it solves some similar problems. And anybody who's interested in exploring this multimodal images and text space might be interested in this. And we'll put this um, on the lesson wiki, of course. And then uh, one more uh, involving the same author in a similar area a little bit later um, was looking at um, attention for fine-grained categorization. So a lot of these things. At least the way I think um, Andrea Frohm was casting it was about fine-grained categorization, which is, you know, how do we build something that can find like very specific kinds of birds or very specific kinds of dogs. But I think these kinds of models have very, very wide applicability. Um, okay.
So um, I mentioned we'd kind of wrap up some final topics around kind of computer vision-y stuff this week before we started looking at um, some more NLP related stuff. Um, one of the things I wanted to zip through uh, was a paper which I think some of you might enjoy, Systematic Evaluation of CNN Advances on the ImageNet dataset. Um, and I've pulled out what I thought was some of, some of the key insights, because some of these are things we haven't really looked at before. Um, one key insight, which uh, is very much the kind of thing I appreciate, is that they compared um, what's the difference between the kind of original Cafe Net slash Alex Net versus Google Net versus VGG Net um, on two different sized images, training on the original 227 or 128. Um, and what this chart shows is that the relative difference between these different uh, architectures is almost exactly the same regardless of what size image you're looking at. And this really reminds me of like in part one when we looked at data augmentation and we said, hey, you can understand which types of data augmentation to use and how much on a small sample of the data rather than on the whole data set. And what this paper is saying is something similar, which is you can look at different architectures on small sized images rather than on full sized images. Um, and so they then use this insight to do all of their experiments from then on using a smaller 128 by 128 image net model. Um, which they said was 10 times faster. Um, so I thought that was um, the kind of thing which not enough academic papers do, which is like, what are the, what are the hacky shortcuts we can get away with? So they tried um, lots of different um, activation functions. Um, it does look like um, max pooling is way better. Um, so this is the gain compared to ReLU. Um, but this one actually has twice the complexity, um, so it doesn't quite say that. Um, what it really says is that something we haven't looked at, which is um, LU, um, which is, as you can see, it's very simple. Um, if uh, x is greater than or equal to 0, it's y equals x, otherwise it's e to the x minus 1. Um, so um, LU basically is just like ReLU, except it's uh, smooth. Um, it's Whereas ReLU looks like that, um, ELU looks exactly the same here, but then here it goes like that. Um, so it's kind of a nice smooth version. Um, so that's one thing you might want to try using. Um, another thing they tried which is interesting was using um, ELU for the convolutional layers and um, um, max, um, sorry, what am I trying to say? Uh, max out uh, for the fully connected layers. I guess nowadays we don't use fully connected layers very much, so you know maybe that's not as interesting. So main, int main interesting thing here, I think, is the EL ELU activation function. Um, two percentage points is quite a big difference. Um, they looked at different um, loading rate annealing approaches. And um, you can use Keras to automatically do learning rate annealing, and what they showed is that linear annealing uh, seems to work the best. Um, they tried something else, which was like, what about different color transformations? You know, and they found that amongst the normal approaches to thinking about color, RGB actually seems to work the best. Um, but then they tried something I haven't seen before, which is they added two one-by-one -one convolutions at the very start of the network. So each of those one by one convolutions is basically doing a linear, um, uh, some kind of linear combination with the channels, um, and uh, with a nonlinearity then in between. And they found that that actually um, gave them quite a big uh, improvement, and uh, that should be pretty much zero cost. Uh, so there's another thing which I haven't really seen written about elsewhere, but it's a good trick. Um, they looked at the uh, impact of batch norm, so here is uh, the impact of batch norm, positive or negative. Um, actually um, adding batch norm to Google Net didn't help, it actually made it worse. Um, so it seems these like really complex, carefully tuned architectures, you've got to be pretty careful, um, or else on a simple network it um, helps a lot. And the amount it helps also depends on um, somewhat which uh, activation function you use. So batch norm, I think we kind of know that now. Um, be careful when you use it. Sometimes it's fantastically helpful. Sometimes it's um, slightly unhelpful. 
question, is there any advantage in using fully connected layers for cloud? Yeah, I mean, I think there is, like they're terribly out of fashion. Um, but I think for transfer learning, they, they still seem to be the best um, in terms of the kind of, um, you know, the, the fully connected layers are super fast train, um, and you seem to get a lot of flexibility there. So um, I don't think we know one way or another yet, but I, I do think that um, PGG still has uh, a lot to, to give us in terms of you know the, the last carefully tuned thing with fully connected layers and that really seems to be great for um, transfer learning. Okay, and then there was a comment saying that LU's advantage is not just that it's smooth but that it goes a little below zero. The mm. paper mentions that this has connections zero and being unused. Yeah yeah that's a great point thank you for adding that. Um, yeah, and anytime you hear me say something slightly stupid, please feel free to jump in because uh, otherwise it's on the video forever. Um, so on the other hand, um, it does give you a, an improvement in accuracy um, if you remove the final max pooling layer, replace all the fully convolutional layers, uh, sorry, fully connected layers with convolutional layers, and stick a average pooling at the end, um, which is basically what this is doing. So. It does seem there's definitely an upside to fully convolutional networks in terms of accuracy, but there may be a downside in terms of flexibility around um, transfer learning. Um, that's a little unclear still. Um, I thought this was an interesting picture I hadn't quite seen before. Let me explain the picture. Um, what this shows is these are different batch sizes along the bottom, okay, and then we've got accuracy. Um, and what it's showing is with a learning rate of 0.01, this is what happens to accuracy. So as you go above 256 batch size, it plummets. On the other hand, if you use a learning rate of 0.01 times batch size over 256, um, it's pretty flat. So what this suggests to me is that any time you change the batch size, this basically is telling you to change the learning rate by a proportional amount. Which I think a lot of us have realized through experiment, but I don't think I've seen it explicitly mentioned before. Um, I think this is very helpful to understand as well is that removing data uh, does has a kind of a nonlinear effect on accuracy. So here's this green line here is what happens when you remove images, right? So with ImageNet down to about half the size of ImageNet, there isn't a huge impact on accuracy. Well, maybe if you want to really speed things up, you could go 128 by 128 sized images and use just 600,000 of them, um, or even maybe 400,000. Uh, but then beneath that, it starts to plummet. Um, so I think that's an interesting insight. Another interesting insight, although I'm going to add something to this in a moment, is that rather than removing images, if you instead um, flip the labels to make them incorrect, um, that has a worse effect than not having the data at all. Um, but there are things we can do to try and improve things there. Um, and specifically, I want to bring your attention to this uh, uh, paper, Training uh, Deep Neural Networks on Noisy Labels with Bootstrapping. And what they show is a very uh, simple approach, a very simple tweak you can add to any training method. Um, which uh, dramatically improves their ability to handle, handle noisy labels. So this here, here is showing uh, the if you add noise varying from 0.3 up to 0.5 um, to MNIST, so up to half of it, um, the uh, baselines are doing nothing at all. Um, it really collapses uh, the accuracy. Um, but if you use their approach to bootstrapping, you can actually go up to nearly half um, the images are uh, being um, intentionally changing their uh, label, and it still works nearly as well. Um, I think this is a really important paper to mention in this like stuff that most of you will find important and useful area because most real-world data sets have noise in them. So maybe this is something you should consider adding to um, everything that you've trained, um, whether it be Kaggle data sets or your own data sets or whatever. Um, um, particularly because you don't necessarily know um, how noisy the labels are. 
Uh, so noisy labels means incorrect. Yeah, noisy just means incorrect. Yeah. So bootstrapping is some sort of technique. That... Yeah, this is this particular paper describes okay. a particular technique, which you can read during the week if you're interested. Um, so interestingly, they find that if you take uh, VGG and then add all of these things together and do them all at once, um, you can actually get a pretty big performance hike. Um, it looks, in fact, like VGG becomes um, uh, more accurate than GoogleNet if you make all these changes. Um, so that's an interesting um, point. Um, although VGG is very, very slow uh, and uh, big. Um, there's lots of stuff that I noticed they didn't look at. They didn't look at data augmentation, different approaches to zooming and cropping, adding skip connections like in uh, ResNet or DenseNet or IO networks. Um, different initialization methods, different amounts of depth, um, and to me the most important uh, is the impact on transfer learning. Um, so these to me are, are, you know, are all open questions as far as I know, and so maybe one of you would like to create the successor to this, you know, the um, um, more observations on training CNNs. Um, there's another interesting paper, although the main interesting thing about this paper is this particular picture, um, so uh, feel free to check it out, it's pretty short and simple. Um, but this paper um, is looking at the um, accuracy uh, versus the size and the speed of different networks. So the size of a bubble is uh, how big is the network, how many parameters does it have. So you can see VGG16 and VGG19 are by far the biggest of any of these networks. Um, interestingly, the second biggest are the very old um, basic AlexNet. Um, so interestingly, newer networks tend to have a lot less parameters, which is a good sign. Uh, then on this axis we have uh, basically uh, how long does it take to cr uh, train. So um, again, VGG is big and slow, um, and uh, without at least some tweaks, um, not terribly accurate. Uh, so again, you know, there's definitely reasons not to use VGG, even if it seems easier for transfer learning, um, or we don't necessarily know how to do a great job of transfer learning on ResNet or Inception. Um, but as you can see, the more recent uh, ResNet and Inception-based approaches are um, significantly more accurate and faster and smaller. Um, so. This is, I think, why you know I was looking um, last week at trying to do transfer learning on top of ResNet. Um, there's, there's really good reasons to want to do that. So I think this is a great picture, and um, you know these these two papers really show us that that academic papers are not always just here's some highly theoretical wacky result. You know, from time to time, people write these great thorough you know, analyses of like best practices and everything that's going on, so there's some really great stuff uh, out there. Um, one other paper to mention in this uh, kind of broad ideas about things that you might find helpful uh, is a paper by um, somebody named Leslie Smith, who I think has got to be just about the most, uh, un, you know, uh, overlooked researcher. Um, Lucy Smith does a lot of really great um, papers, which I really like. Um, and this particular paper came up with a list of uh, 14 design patterns, which seem to be uh, generally associated with, with better CNNs. Um, and this is a great paper to read. It's, um, it's a really easy read. You guys won't have any trouble with it at all, I don't think. And it's very short. Um, but I really, I looked through all these and I just kind of thought, yeah, these all make a lot of sense, and so as you, if you're doing something a bit different and a bit new, and you have to design a new architecture, um, this would be a great list of patterns to look through. Uh, one more Leslie Smith paper to mention, um, and it's crazy that this is not more well known. Um, something incredibly simple, which is a different approach to learning rates. Rather than just having your learning rate gradually decrease, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed that sometimes if you Kind of suddenly increase the learning rate for a bit and then suddenly decrease it again for a bit, it kind of goes into a better little area. Um, so what this paper suggests doing is try actually continually increasing your learning rate and then decreasing it, increasing it, decreasing it, increasing it, decreasing it, something that they call cyclical learning rates. Um, 
and check out the impact. Um, compared to um, kind of non-cyclical approaches, uh, it is way, way faster um, and much, and it gets, and it's kind of far, at, at every point, it's much better. Um, and this is something which you could easily add. And I haven't seen this added to any library. Uh, so, like, if you created the cyclical learning rate annealing uh, class for Keras, you know, many people would thank you. Uh, well, actually, many people would have no idea what you're talking about, so they don't have to write the blog post to explain why it's good and show them this picture, and then they would thank you. Um, I just sort of quickly add the Keras has lots of callbacks that I actually play with something. Yeah, so exactly. Just create a loop with a bunch of callbacks. Right. And, kind of right. Start. And, and if I was doing this in Keras, what I would do would be I would start with um, the existing um, learning rate annealing code that's there and, you know, make small changes until it starts working. Because there's already, um, yeah, there's already code that, that does pretty much everything you want. Um, the other cool thing about this paper is that they suggest a fairly automated approach to picking what the minimum and maximum bounds should be. And again, this idea of like roughly what should our learning rate be is something which we tend to use a lot of trial and error for. So check out this paper for a suggestion about how to do it um, somewhat automatically. Okay, so there's um, a whole bunch of things that I've zipped over. Normally I would have dug into each of those and explained it and shown examples in notebooks and stuff, but this is like a, you know, you guys hopefully now have enough knowledge to take this information and, and, and play with it. And what I'm hoping is that different people will play with different parts and come back and tell us what you find. And um, you know, hopefully we'll get some good new uh, contributions to Keras or PyTorch or some blog posts or some papers or so forth. Um, or maybe with that device stuff, even some new applications. So the next thing I wanted to look at, and again, somewhat briefly, um, is the data science bot. Um, and the reason I particularly wanted to dig into the data science bowl is um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, one of them, well, there's a million reasons. Uh, it's a million dollar prize, um, and uh, there are 23 days to go. Um, the second is it's it's an extension to everything that you guys have learned so far about computer vision. It's it uses all the techniques you've learned, but then some. So rather than 2D images, they're going to be 3D volumes. Um, rather than being kind of 300 by 300 or 500 by 500, they're going to be 512 by 512 by 200. So like a couple of hundred times bigger than stuff you've dealt with before. Um, the stuff we learned in lesson seven about like where are the fish, um, you're going to be needing to use a lot of that. Um, so I think it's a really interesting um, problem to solve. And then I personally uh, care a lot about this because um, my previous startup in Lytic was the first organization to use deep learning to tackle this exact problem, which is um, um, trying to find lung cancer in CT scans. Um, the reason I made that in Lytic's first problem um, uh, was mainly because I learned that if you can find lung cancer earlier, the probability of survival is 10 times higher. Um, so here is something where you can have a real impact, you know, by, by doing this well. Um, which is not to say that a million dollars isn't a big impact as well. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about, um, about this problem. Um, here is, uh, here is a lung. Um, and this is in a, um, a DICOM viewer. DICOM, D-I-C-O-M, uh, is the standard that is used for sharing most kinds of medical imaging, certainly CT scans. Um, it is a format which contains um, two main things. One is a stack of images, and another is some metadata. So that metadata will be things like how much radiation were they zapped by, and how far away from the chest was the machine, and uh, what brand of machine was it, and so on and so forth. Um, so you can, uh, for most icon viewers, just use your um, scroll wheel to zip through them. And so all this is doing is like going from 
from top to bottom or from bottom to top. Um, and so, kind of see what's going on. Do you have something, Rachel? I was just saying, do you want to or orient like? Uh, yeah, so you can, you can, well, actually, what I might do, I think is more interesting, is to um, say, um, well, like, let's actually focus on the bit that's going to matter to you, which is the inside of the lung is this dark area here. And these little white dots are what's called the vasculature, so all the little vessels and stuff going through the lungs. And as I scroll through, please have a look at this little dot. You'll see that it seems to move. Right? See how it's moving? And the reason it's moving is because it's not a dot, it's actually um, a, a, a vessel going through space. Um, so it actually looks like this. Right? And so if you take a slice through that, it looks like lots of dots. Right? And so as you go through those slices, it looks like that. Right? And then eventually we get to the top of the lung, and that's why you see um, eventually it kind of all goes to white. Right? So that's the, the edge, basically, of the organ. Um, so you can see there are edges on each side. Um, then there's also bone. So some of you have been looking at this already over the last few weeks and have often asked me about how to deal with like multiple images. And what I've said each time is don't think of it as multiple images. Um, think of it in the way your DICOM viewer can if you have a 3D button like this one does. That's actually what we're just looking at. Right? So it's not a bunch of flat images. It's a 3D volume, right? It just so happens that the default way that most DICOM viewers show things is by a bunch of flat images. Okay? But it's really important that you think of it as a 3D volume because you're looking in this space. Right? Now, what are you looking for in this space? Well, what you're looking for in order is you're looking for somebody who has lung cancer. And what somebody who has lung cancer looks like is that somewhere in this space there is a, a blob, right? Like a, it could be roughly spherical uh, blob. It could be pretty small, like around five mil, five millimeters is where people start to get particularly concerned about a blob. Um, and so what that means is that for a radiologist, as they flick through a scan like this, is that they're looking for a dot which doesn't move, but which appears, gets bigger, and then disappears. That's what a blob looks like, right? So you can see why radiologists very, very, very often miss um, nodules, blobs in lungs. Because in all of this area, you know, you've got to have extraordinary vision to be able to see every little blob appear and then disappear again. And remember, the sooner you catch it, you get a 10x uh, improved chance of survival. And generally speaking, when a radiologist looks at one of these scans, they're not looking for nodules. They're looking for something else, because lung cancer, at least in the earlier stages, is asymptomatic. It doesn't cause you to feel different, right? So it's like something that every radiologist has to be thinking about when they're looking for pneumonia or, or whatever else. Um, so that's the basic idea, is that we're going to try and come up with, um, in the next um, half hour or so, some, some idea about how would you find these blobs, how would you find these nodules. So uh, each of these things uh, generally is about 512 by 512 by a couple of hundred. Okay? Um, and each of those, uh, and the equivalent of a pixel in 3D space is called a voxel. Right, so a voxel simply means uh, a pixel in 3D space. So this here is rendering a bunch of voxels. Okay. Um, each voxel in a CT scan um, is a 12-bit integer, um, memory serves me correctly, and a computer screen can only show um, 8 bits of grayscale. And furthermore, your eyes can't necessarily distinguish between all those grayscale uh, perfectly anyway. So what um, every DICOM viewer provides is something called um, a, a windowing adjustment. So a windowing adjustment 
Um, here is the default window, um, which is designed to basically map some subset of that 12-bit space to, to the screen so that it highlights certain things. And so the units, uh, CT scans you, uh, use are called Hounsfield units, and different uh, certain um, ranges of Hounsfield units tell you that something is some particular uh, part of the body. And so you can see here that the bone is being lit up. So we've selected an image window which is um, designed to allow us to see the bone clearly. Um, so what I did when I opened this was I switched it to CT's chest, which is uh, some kind person has already figured out what the best uh, window is. How did that change? Um, okay. Yes. Oh, sorry, CT lungs uh, has t figured out what's the best window to see the nodules and vasculature in lungs. Right? Now, for you working in with deep learning, you don't have to care about that because, of course, the deep learning algorithm can see 12 bits perfectly well, um, and so nothing really to worry about. Um, so one of the th challenges um, with dealing with this um, uh, data science bold data is that there's a lot of pre-processing to do. Um, but the good news is that uh, there's a couple of uh, fantastic tutorials. So hopefully you've found out by now that on Kaggle, if you click on the kernels button, um, you basically get to see people's IPython notebooks, effectively, where they show you how to do certain things. So in this case, this guy um, has got a full pre-processing tutorial. Um, showing how to load DICOM, uh, convert the values to Hounsfield units, um, and so forth. And I'll show you some of these pieces. Um, so DICOM um, you will load with, um, with some library, probably with PyDICOM. And so PyDICOM is a library that kind of, it's a bit like PILO, PILO or PIO, you know, an image.open, this is more like a DICOM.open, and end up with a um, 3D uh, file. Uh, and of course the metadata. Um, you can see here using the metadata, image position, slice location. Okay, so the metadata comes through with just attributes um, of the Python object. Um, and uh, this person has very kindly provided to you a list of the um, uh, Hounsfield unit, oh, it's just copied from Wikipedia, Hounsfield units uh, for each of the different substances. Okay. So, um, so he shows how to trans translate stuff into that range, um, and so it's great to draw lots of pictures. So here is a um, histogram for this particular picture. Right? So you can see that most of it is air, right? and then you get some bone and some lung matter. Um, there's the actual slice. Um, so then the next thing to think about is um, the, um, the, the it's really voxel spacing, um, which is as you move across one bit of x-axis or one bit of y-axis or from slice to slice, how far in like the real world are you moving, right? And one of the annoying things about medical imaging is that different kinds of scanners have different distances between those slice and slices, it's called the slice thickness, and different um, the different meanings of the X and Y axes. Um, luckily that stuff's all in the DICOM metadata, so the resampling process means taking that um, those lists of slices and turning it into something where every step in the X direction or the Y direction or the Z direction equals one millimeter in the real world. Right? And so it would be very annoying for your deep learning network if your different lung images were squished by different amounts, um, especially if you didn't give it the metadata about how much was being squished. Um, so that's what resampling does. And as you can see, it's using the slice thickness and the pixel spacing um, to make everything nice and even. Um, so there are various ways to um, uh, do 3D plots, and it's always a good idea to do that. Um, um, and then something else that people tend to do is um, segmentation. And 
Depending on time, we may or may not get around to looking more at segmentation um, in this part of the course, but effectively segmentation is just another generative model. It's a generative model where you know, hopefully somebody's given you some things saying this is lung, this is air, and then you build a model that tries to predict for something else what's lung and what's air. Um, unfortunately uh, for um, lung CT scans, we don't generally have that kind of ground truth of you know which bits lung and which bits air. So generally speaking, in medical imaging, people use a whole lot of uh, heuristic approaches, so kind of hacky rule-based approaches. Um, and in particular, um, applications of re region growing and morphological operations. Um, you know, I find this kind of the boring part of medical imaging because like it's so clearly a dumb way to do things. Um, but you know, deep learning is far too new in this area yet to kind of develop the data sets that we need to do this properly. Um, but the good news is that um, there's a button which I don't think many people notice exists called Tutorial on the main Data Science Ball page, where um, uh, these folks from Bruzel and Hamilton actually show you a complete segmentation approach. Now, it's interesting that they picked unit segmentation. Um, this is definitely the thing about segmentation I would be teaching you guys if we have time. Um, unit is one of these things that outside of the Kaggle world I don't think that many people are familiar with. Um, but inside the Kaggle world we know that anytime segmentation crops up, UNET wins. Uh, and like it's, it's the best. Um, more recently there's actually been uh, something called um, dense net for segmentation, which takes UNET even a little bit further, and maybe that would be the new winner um, for newer Kaggle competitions when they happen. Um, but the basic idea here of things like UNET and dense net is that we have a model where, maybe I can draw it, um, you know, when we uh, do generative models, we um, like think about doing a style transfer. We generally start with this kind of large image, and then we do some downsampling operations to make it a smaller image, and then we do some computation, and then we make it bigger again. Right, with these upsampling operations. Um, what happens in UNET is that there are additional neural network connections made directly from here to here, and directly from here to here, and here to here, and here to here. And those connections basically allow it to um, almost do like a kind of a residual learning approach, like it can figure out the key pieces, you know, kind of semantic pieces at the really low resolution. But then as it upscales it, it can learn, well what was special about the difference between the downsampled image and the original image here? And it can kind of learn to add that additional detail at each point. Um, so UNET and DenseNet or segmentation um, are really interesting, and I, I hope we find some time to get back to them in this part of the course. But if we don't, um, you can get started by looking at this uh, tutorial uh, in which uh, these folks basically show you from scratch. And what they try to do in this tutorial is something very specific, which is the detection part. So. What happens in this kind of, like think about the fisheries competition. Um, we pretty much decided that in the fisheries competition if you wanted to do really well, you would first of all find the fish, and then you would zoom into the fish, and then you would figure out what kind of fish it is. Certainly in the right whale competition earlier, that was how that was won. For this competition this is even more clearly going to be the approach, because these images are just far too big to do a normal convolutional neural network. So we need one step that's going to find the nodule, and then a second step that's going to zoom into a possible nodule and figure out is this a malignant tumor or something else, a false positive. Um, the bad news is that the Data Science Bowl dataset does not give you any information at all about 
um, for the training set, um, where are the cancerous nodules? Which I actually wrote a post in the Kaggle forums about this. I just think this is a terrible, terrible idea because you know they're not like that. That information actually exists. The the data set they got this from is something called the um, National Lung Screening Trial, which actually has that information or something pretty close to it. Um, so the fact they didn't provide it is, I, I just think it's horrible. You know, for a competition which which can save lives, and uh, I can't begin to imagine. Um, the good news, though, is that there is a data set which does have this information. Um, the original data set was called um, LIDC IDRI, I D R I. Um, but interestingly, that data set was recently um, used for another competition, a non capital competition called LUNA, L U N A. Um, that competition is now finished. Um, and one of the tracks in that competition was actually a, specifically a false positive detection track. Um, so, and then the other track was a find the nodule track, basically. So you can actually go back and look at the papers written by the winners. Um, they're generally ridiculously short. Um, many of them are a single sentence saying, for commercial confidentiality agreement, we can't do anything. Um, but some of them, including the winner of the false positive um, track, um, is a, you know, they actually provide it. Not surprisingly, they all use deep learning. Um, and so what you could do, in fact, I think what you have to do to do well in this competition is download the lunar data set. Use that to build a nodule detection algorithm. So the lunar uh, data set includes, you know, files saying this lung has nodules here, 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 and here. Right. So do nodule detection based on that, and then run that nodule detection algorithm on the Kaggle data set. Find the nodules and then use that to do some classification. Um, you, there are some tricky things with that. Um, the biggest tricky thing is that. Most of the um, CT scans in the lunar data set are what's called contrast studies. Um, a contrast scan means that uh, the patient had a radioactive dye injected into them so that um, the things that they're looking for are easier to see. Um, the, for, the, um, the, for the National Lung Screening Trial, which is what they use in the Kaggle data set, none of them use contrast. And the reason why is that what we really want to be able to do is to take anybody who's like over 65 and has been smoking more than a pack a day for more than 20 years and give them all a CT scan and find out which ones have cancer, but in the process we don't want to be shooting them up with radioactive dye and giving them cancer. So that's why we try to make sure that when we're doing um, um, these kind of asymptomatic scans that they're as um, low radiation dose as possible. So that means that you're going to have to think about uh, transfer learning issues, that the, the, the contrast in your image is going to be different between the thing you build on the lunar data set, the nodule detection, and the Kaggle uh, competition data set. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's a, uh, when I looked at it, I didn't find that that was a terribly difficult problem. Um, I'm sure you won't find it. Um, uh, Impossible by any means. Um, so to finalize this discussion, um, I wanted to uh, refer to this paper, which I'm guessing not that many people have read yet. Um, it's a medical imaging paper. And what it is, is a non-deep learning approach to trying to find nodules. So that's where they use, you know, they're saying here, uh, oh, sorry. Um, um, nodule segmentation. Um, yes, Rachel. Give a correction from our radiologist. Oh, good. Um, saying that dye is not radioactive; it's just dense isoview seventy or isoview. Okay, but there's a reason we don't inject people with the contrast um, dye. The issues are contrast and nephropath allergic reactions. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> uh, I do know, though, that the uh, NLST, um, again, radiologists correct me, um, the NLST um, uh, studies use a lower amount of radioactivity um, um, than I think the lunar ones do, so that's another difference. Um, great, okay. Um, so um, this is a um, 
interesting idea of like how can you find nodules using more of a heuristic approach? And the heuristic approach they suggest here is to um, do clustering. And we haven't really done any clustering in class yet, so we're going to dig into this in some detail. Um, because I think this is a great idea for the kind of heuristics that you can add on top of deep learning to make deep learning work in, in different areas. The basic idea here is to, um, uh, as you can say, they call it a five-dimensional mean. Um, they're going to try and find groups of voxels which are similar, and they're going to cluster them together. And hopefully we're going to particularly cluster together things that look like nodules. Um, so the idea is at the end of this segmentation, then there will be one cluster for the whole lung boundary, one cluster for the whole vasculature, and then one cluster for every nodule. So the five dimensions are x, y, and z, pretty straightforward, uh, intensity, so the number of Hounsfield units, and then the fifth one is volumetric shape index, and this is the one tricky one. Um, the basic idea here is it's going to be a combination of the different curvatures of a voxel um, based on the uh, Gaussian and mean curvatures. Now what the paper goes on to explain is that you can um, use for these the um, first and second derivatives of the image. Now all that basically means is you subtract one voxel from its neighbor, right? And then you take that whole thing and subtract one voxel's version of that from its neighbor. You get the first and second derivatives. So it kind of just tells you the you know, direction um, of the change of image intensity at that point. Um, so by getting these uh, first and second derivatives of the image and then you put it into this formula, it comes out with something which basically tells you how um, sphere-like um, this voxel seems to be, part of how, of how sphere-like a construct. Um, so, so that's great, right? If we can basically take all the voxels and combine the ones that are nearby, have a similar number of Hounsfield units, and seem to be of similar kinds of shapes, um, we're going to get um, what we want. So I'm not going to worry about this bit here because it's very specific to medical imaging. Um, anybody who's interested in doing this, um, feel free to talk on the forum about what this looks like in Python. Um, um, but what I did want to talk about was the mean shift clustering, um, which is a particular approach to clustering, which they talk about. I just received a comment that the voice from the other mic breaks up. It's hard to understand another. Okay. I think that being this mic. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Rachel, can you say something again? Clustering is something which um, for a long time I've been kind of a, an anti-fan of. Um, it belongs to this, this uh, group of unsupervised learning algorithms which always seem to be kind of looking for a problem to solve. Um, but I've realized recently there are some specific problems that can be solved well with them. Um, and I'm going to be showing you a couple, um, one today and one in lesson 14. Um, clustering algorithms are perhaps the best easiest to describe by what they do by generating some data to show them. Um, here's some generated data, right? I'm going to create six clusters, and for each cluster I'll create 250 samples. So um, I'm going to basically say, okay, let's create a bunch of centroids by creating some random numbers. So six pairs of random numbers for my centroids. Um, and then I'll um, grab a bunch of random numbers around each of those centroids and combine them all together and then plot them. And so here you can see um, each of these x's represents a centroid. Okay, so a centroid is just like the average point for a cluster of data, and each color represents one cluster. So imagine um, if this was showing you um, clusterings of different kinds of um, lung tissue, um, you know, ideally you'd have some voxels that were um, colored one thing for a nodule and a bunch of other things that are co colored a different color for vasculature and so forth. Um, we can only show this uh, easily in two dimensions, 
um, but there's no reason to not be able to imagine doing this in um, certainly five dimensions. So the goal of clustering will be to um, undo this, right? Given the data, but not the x's, how can you figure out where the x's were, right? So basically, and then um, it's pretty straightforward once you know where the x's are to then find the closest points to that to assign every um, data point to a cluster. The most popular approach to clustering is called um, k-means. Um, k-means is a, an approach where you have to decide up front how many clusters are there, um, and what it basically does is there's um, two steps. Um, the first one is to um, guess as to where those clusters might be. Um, and the really simple way to do that is just to. I wonder if I've got pictures of this. I don't. Um, the simple way to do that is basically to randomly pick a point, and then start randomly picking points which are um, uh, as far away as possible from all the previous ones I've picked. So if I um, and you throw away the first one. So if I started here, right, then probably the furthest away point would be down here, right. So this would be like our starting point for cluster one. And I'd say, okay, what point is the furthest away from that? That's probably this one here. Right, so we are starting point for cluster two. Okay, what's the furthest point away from both of these? Probably what this one over here, and so forth. So you keep doing that to get your kind of initial points, and then you just iteratively move uh, every point. Uh, so you basically then say, okay, which cluster? These are the clusters. Let's assume these are the clusters. Um, uh, which cluster does every point belong to, and then you just iteratively move the points um, to different clusters and um, a bunch of times. Um, now, k-means, um, it's a shame it's so popular um, because it kind of sucks, right? Suck, sucky thing number one is that um, you have to decide how many clusters there are, and like the whole point is we don't know how many nodules there are, right? Um, and then sucky thing number two is without some changes to do something called kernel k-means, um, it only works if the things are the same shape. You know, they're all kind of nicely Gaussian shaped. Um, so we're going to talk about something way cooler, um, which um, I only kind of came across somewhat recently, um, much less well known, which is called mean shift clustering. Now, mean shift clustering um, is one of these things which seems to spend um, all of its time in um, kind of serious mathematician land. Um, like whenever I tried to kind of look up something about mean shift clustering, I kind of started seeing this kind of thing. And this is like the first tutorial, not in the PDF that I could find. Um, so okay, so this is one way to think about mean shift clustering. Um, Another way is a code first approach, um, which is that this is the entire algorithm. Um, so let's talk about what's going on here. What, is, what are we doing? Um, at a high level, we're going to do a bunch of loops, right? Uh, so we're going to do five steps. Um, it would be better if I didn't do five steps, but I kept doing this until it was stable. But um, for now, I'm just going to do five steps. And each step, I'm going to go through. So our data is x, right? I'm going to go through, um, enumerate through our data. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find, okay, so a small x is the current data point I'm looking at. Right? Now what I want to do is find out how far away is this data point from every other data point. So I'm going to create a vector of distances. And I'm going to do that with the magic of broadcasting. Right? So a small x is a vector of size 2, just as two coordinates. And big X is of length of um, size is a matrix of size n by two, where n is the number of points. And thanks to what we've now learned about broadcasting, we know that we could subtract a matrix from a vector, and that vector will be broadcast across the axis of the matrix. And so this is going to subtract every element of big X from little x. And so if we then go ahead and square that, and then sum it up. And then take the square root. This is going to return a vector of distances of um, small x uh, to every element of big x. Okay. 
Um, and we, the, su the sum here is just summing up the two coordinates. Okay. Okay, so that's step one. So we now know for this particular data point how far away is it from all of the other data points. Now the next thing we want to do is to um, the final. Well, let's go to the final step. The final step will be to take a weighted average, right? So we're basically going to in the final step we're going to say um, what cluster do you belong to? So let's draw this. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of data points, and we're currently looking at this one. Okay, and what we've done is we've now got a list of how far it is away from all of the other data points. And the basic idea is now what we want to do is take the weighted average of all of those data points weighted by the inverse of that distance. So the things that are a long way away, we want to weight very small, and the things that are very close, we want to weight very big, right? So I think this is probably the closest, okay? And this is about the second closest, and then this is about the third closest. So assuming these got most of the weight, the average is going to be somewhere about here, right? And so by doing that, every point, we're going to move every point closer to where its friends are, closer to where the nearby things are. And so if we keep doing this again and again, everything's going to move until it's right next to its friends. So how do we take something which initially is a distance and make it so that the larger distances have smaller weights? And the answer is we probably want to shape it looks something like that. In other words, a Gaussian. This is by no means the only shape you could choose. Right? Uh, it would be equally valid to choose this shape, which is a triangle, at least half of one. In general though, note that if we're going to multiply every point by one of these things um, and add them all together, it would be nice if all of our weights added to one, right? because then we're going to end up with something that's of the same scale that we start with. So when you create one of these um, curves where it all adds up to one, um, generally speaking we call that a kernel. And I mention this because you will see kernels everywhere, um, if you haven't already. Um, now that you've seen it, um, you'll see them everywhere. In fact, um, kernel methods is a whole area of machine learning that in the late 90s basically took over um, because it was so theoretically pure, and if you want to get published uh, in conference proceedings it's much more important to be theoretically pure than actually accurate. Um, so for a long time kernel methods um, won out and um, neural networks in particular disappeared. Um, eventually people realized that accuracy was important as well, and um, in more recent times kernel methods are largely disappearing. Um, but you still see the idea of a kernel coming up um, very often, because they're super useful um, tools to have. They're basically something that lets you take a number, like in this case a distance, and turn it into some other number where you can um, weight everything by that other number and add them together to get a nice little weighted average. So in our case we're going to use a Gaussian kernel. Um, the particular formula for a Gaussian doesn't matter. I remember learning this formula in grade 10 and it was by far the most terrifying mathematical formula I'd ever seen, um, but it doesn't really matter. right? That's um, for those of you that remember or have seen the Gaussian formula, you'll recognize it. For those of you that haven't, it doesn't matter. Um, but this is the function that draws that curve. Okay, so if we take every one of our distances and put it through um, the Gaussian, um, we will then get back a bunch of weights that add to 1. Okay, so then in the final step, we can multiply every one of our data points by that weight, okay, 
uh, add them up and divide by the sum of the weights, in other words, take a weighted average. You'll notice that I have to be a bit careful about broadcasting here, um, because I needed to add a unit axis um, at the end uh, of my dimensions, not at the start. So by default it adds um, unit axes to the beginning when you do broadcasting. That's why I had to do an expand dims. Um, if you're not clear on why this is, then that's a sign you definitely need to do some more playing around with broadcasting. Um, so um, have a fiddle with that during the week. Um, feel free to ask if you're not clear after you've experimented. Um, but this is just a weighted sum, right? So this is just doing um, sum of weights times x divided by sum of weights. Um, importantly, um, there's a nice little thing that we can pass to a Gaussian, which is the thing that decides, does it look like the thing I just drew, or does it look like this, or does it look like this? All, right. all of those things add up to one, they all have the same area underneath, but they're very different shapes. Um, if we make it look like this, then what that's going to do is it's going to create a lot more clusters, right? because things that are really close to it are going to have really high weights, and everything else is going to have a tiny weight and be meaningless. Whereas if we use something like this, we're going to have much fewer clusters, because even stuff that's further away is going to have a higher weight in the weighted sum. So um, the choice that you use for the, um, this is called the um, kernel width, that's got lots of different names you can use. Um, uh, we actually from here I've used BW being bandwidth. Um, that number, there's actually some cool ways to choose it. Um, one simple way to choose it is to um, find out which size of bandwidth uh, covers, say, one third of the data um, in your data set. I think that's the approach that um, Scikit-learn uses. Um, so anyway, there are some ways that you can um, automatically figure out um, the bandwidth, um, which is one of the very nice things about MinShift. Okay, so we just go through a bunch of times, five times, and each time we replace every point with its weighted average um, uh, weighted by the, this Gaussian kernel. And so when we run this five times, it takes a second, and here's the results. I've offset everything by one just so that we can see it, right? Otherwise it would be right on top of the x. So you can see that um, for nearly all of them, it's in exactly the right spot, um, or else for this cluster, let's just remind ourselves what that cluster looked like, for this, these two clusters, um, this particular bandwidth, it decided to create one cluster for them rather than two. Okay, So this is kind of an example where else if we um, decreased our bandwidth, it would create two clusters. And uh, there's no one right answer, um, um, that should be one or two. So. One challenge with this is that it's um, kind of slow, right? So I thought, um, let's try and uh, accelerate it for the GPU. Right? And um, because MainShift's not very cool, um, uh, nobody seems to have implemented it for the GPU yet, or maybe it's just not a good idea, so um, I thought I'd use PyTorch. And the reason I use PyTorch is because it really feels like writing PyTorch just feels like writing NumPy. Everything happens straight away. So I really hoped that I could take my um, original code and make it almost the same. And indeed, um, here is the um, entirety of mean shift in PyTorch. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, you can see rather than um, you know, anywhere that I used to have um, NP, it now says torch, um, np.array is now torch.floatensor, um, np.square root is torch.square root, um, everything else is almost the same. Um, one issue is that torch doesn't support broadcasting. Um, so we'll talk more about this shortly um, in a couple of weeks, but uh, basically I decided that's not okay, so I wrote my own broadcasting library for PyTorch. Um, so this, rather than saying x, little x minus big x, I use sub for subtract. That's the subtract from my broadcasting library. Okay. If you're curious, um, check out Torch Utils and you can see my broadcasting operations there. Um, but basically if you use those, you can see the same for multiplication. 
um, it'll do all the broadcasting for you. Um, okay, um, so as you can see, um, this uh, looks basically identical to the previous code, um, but it takes longer. So that's not ideal. Um, one problem here is that I'm not using CUDA. Okay, so I could easily fix that by adding .cuda to my x, um, but that made it slower still. Um, and the reason why is that all the work's being done in this for loop, and um, PyTorch doesn't accelerate for loops. Like each run through a for loop in PyTorch is basically doing is basically calling a new CUDA kernel each time you're going through. And it takes a certain amount of time to even launch a CUDA kernel. Um, uh, this is rather annoying, sorry. Uh, when I'm saying CUDA kernel, this is a different usage of the word kernel. Um, in CUDA, uh, kernel refers to a little piece of code that runs on the GPU. Um, so it's launching a little GPU process every time through the for loop, which takes quite a bit of time, and it's also having to copy data all over the place. So. Um, Although I guess the right result, so that's good. Um, so what I then tried to do was to make it faster. Um, the trick is to do it um, by mini batch, right? So each time through the loop, we want to don't want to do just one um, uh, piece of data, but a mini batch of data. So here are the changes I made. Um, the main one was that my for i now jumps through one batch size at a time. Right? So I'm going to go not 0, 1, 2, 3, but 0, 16, 32. Um, okay, so I now need to create a slice which is um, from um, i to i plus batch size, um, unless we've gone past the end of the data, in which case it's just as far as n. Okay, so this is going to refer to the slice of data that we're interested in. So what we can now do is say x with that slice to grab back um, all of the data in this mini batch. And so then I had to create a special version of, I can't just say subtract anymore, I need to think carefully about the broadcasting operations here. I'm going to return a matrix, now let's say batch size is 32, I'm going to have 32 rows, right? And then let's say n is a thousand, it'll be a thousand columns. And that shows me how far away each thing in my batch is from every piece of data. Right? So when we do things a batch at a time, you're basically adding another axis to all of your tensors. Suddenly now you have a batch axis all the time. And when we've been doing deep learning, that's been like something I think we've got pretty used to, right? The first um, axis in all of our tensors has always been a batch axis. So now we're writing our own GPU accelerated algorithm. Uh, can you believe how crazy this is? Like uh, uh, two years ago, writing a GPU, like if you Google for like K means CUDA or K means GPU, you get back like research studies where people write papers about how to put these algorithms in GPUs because like it was hard. Um, and here's a page of code. That does it. So that is, this is crazy. This is possible. But here we are. We have built a, a, a batch by batch uh, GPU accelerated mean shift algorithm. So the basic distance formula is exactly the same. I just have to be careful about where um, I added um, unsqueeze is the same as um, expand dims in NumPy. So I just have to be careful about where I add my unit axes. Uh, add it to the first axis of one bit. And the second axis of the other bit, and so that's going to do like a subtract every one of these from every one of these, return a matrix. Um, again, this is like a really good um, time to look at this and like think why does this broadcasting work? Because um, uh, this is getting more and more complex broadcasting, and hopefully you can now see the value of broadcasting, right? Um, not only did I get to avoid writing uh, a pair of uh, nested for loops here, but I also got to do this all on the GPU in a single operation, so I've made this <coughs> thousands of times faster. Um, so here is a single operation which does that entire matrix <coughs> subtraction. Um, yes, Rachel? Uh, 
I was just going to suggest that we take a break soon. It's yeah. 10 to 8. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, um, so that's our um, batch-wise distance function. Uh, we then chuck that into a Gaussian. And because this is just um, element-wise, the Gaussian function hasn't changed at all. So that's nice. Um, and then I've got um, my weighted sum. Um, and then divide that by the sum of weights. Uh, so that's basically the algorithm. So previously, um, for my NumPy version, it took a second. Um, now it's 48 milliseconds. So we've just sped that up by 20x. Okay. Um, yes, Rachel. We have a question. I get how batching helps with locality and cache, but I do not quite follow how it helps otherwise, especially with respect to accelerating the for loop. Yeah. So. Um, in PyTorch, the for loop is not run on the GPU. The for loop is run on your CPU, and your CPU goes through each step of the for loop and calls the GPU to say, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing. Right? So this is not to say you can't accelerate this in TensorFlow you know, in a similar way. Like in TensorFlow, there's a tf.while and stuff like that where you can actually do GPU-based loops. Um, even still, uh, if you do it entirely in, in a loop in Python, it's going to be pretty difficult to get this performance. But particularly in PyTorch, it's important to remember in PyTorch, your loops are not optimized. It's what you do inside each loop that's optimized. And we have another question. Some of the math functions are coming from Torch and others are coming from the math Python library. What is the difference? When you use the Python math library, does that mean the GPU is not being used? Yeah, so um, um, you'll see that I use that um, math.pi as a constant and then math.square root of 2 times pi as a constant. So I don't need to use the GPU to calculate a constant, obviously. Um, so yeah, we only use uh, torch for things that are um, running on a, a vector or a matrix or a tensor of, um, of data. Um, okay, so let's have a break. Um, we'll come back uh, in 10 minutes, so that'll be 2 past 8, and we'll talk about some ideas I have for improving mean shift, which maybe you guys will want to try uh, during the week. Okay. So basically the, the idea here is um, we, we figure that there are two, uh, two steps we need to figure out uh, where, the nodules are where, where the nodules are in something like this, um, if any. Um, step number one is to find the things that may be kind of nodule-ish, zoom into them and create a little cropped version. Um, and then step two would be where your deep learning particularly comes in, which is to figure out is that cancerous or not. Um, the once you've found a, a nodule-ish thing, the, the cancerous ones um, actually by far the by far the biggest driver of whether or not something is um, a malignant cancer is how big it is, right? So like it's that's it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing particularly important is like how kind of spidery it looks. Um, if it looks like it's kind of evilly going out to capture more territory, that's probably a bad sign as well. Um, so the kind of the size and the shape are the two things that you're going to be wanting to try and find, and obviously that's a pretty a good thing for a neural net to, to be able to do. You probably don't need that many examples of it. Um, when you get to that point, there's obviously a question about you know how to deal with the 3D aspect here. Um, you can just create a 3D convolutional neural net. Um, so if you had like a um, 10 by 10 by 10 space, that's obviously certainly not going to be too big. And if it's 20 by 20 by 20, you might be okay. And you know, kind of think about how big a volume can you create. Um, there's plenty of papers around on 3D convolutions, although I'm not sure if you even need one because it's just a convolution in 3D. Um, the uh, other approach that you might find interesting to think about is something called triplanar. Um, what triplanar means is that you take a slice through the x and the, um, and the y and the z axes, and so you basically end up with three images. Um, one is a slice through x, y, and z, 
and then you can kind of treat those as different channels, if you like, even. Um, they probably use pretty standard um, neural net libraries that expect three channels. Um, so there's a couple of ideas um, for how you can deal with the 3D aspect of it. The, um, I think using this, uh, the, the lunar um, data set as much as possible is going to be a good idea, because you really want something that's pretty good at detecting nodules um, before you start putting it onto the Kaggle data set, because the other problem with the Kaggle data set is it's ridiculously small, um, and again, there's no reason for it. Like there are far more um, cases in NLST than they've provided to Kaggle, um, so I can't begin to imagine why they went to all this trouble and a million dollars of money for something which has not been set up to succeed. Um, anyway, that's not our problem, uh, it makes it all a more interesting um, thing to play with. Um, um, but uh, you know, after the competition's finished, if you get interested in it, you'll probably want to go and download the whole NLST data set. Um, or as much as possible and, and do it properly. And actually there are two questions uh, that I wanted to read. Um, one is, oh, one is just um, for the audio stream, there are occasional max volume pops um, that are really hard on the ears for remote listeners. Um, this might not be solvable right now, but something to look into. Okay. Um, and then someone asked, uh, last class you mentioned that you would explain when and why to use Keras versus PyTorch. If you only had brain and space for one, in the same way some only have brain space for um, VI or Emacs, um, which would you pick? Okay. Um, so I just reduced the volume a little bit, so let us know if that helps. Um, I would. Um, I would pick PyTorch. Um, like it feels like it kind of does everything Keras does, but gives you the flexibility to really play around a lot more. Um, yeah, but I'm sure you've got brain space for both. Um, so, question: You mentioned there are other data sets of uh, cancerous images that uh, has like labels and proper marks. Yeah, so, so can we like. The loon is thing on that data set. Yeah, that was that was my suggestion. So, and that's what the tutorial shows how to do. Um, yeah, um, there's a whole um, thing uh, kernel on Kaggle called Candidate Generation and Luna 16 something something, um, which uh, shows how to um, use Luna to build a uh, a nodule finder. And this is one of the highest rated um, Kaggle kernels. We've now used kernel in three totally different ways in this lesson. See if we can come up with a fourth. Kaggle kernels, CUDA kernels, and kernel methods. Um, yeah, uh, so this is, um, uh, in fact, looks very familiar, doesn't it? So here's a, um, a Keras uh, approach to finding uh, lung nodules. Um, based on uh, Luna. Um, so, there are such things like VGG in 3D, like we can make yeah. convolutions instead of rectangles, like cubes. And yeah, yeah. That's, that's the thing about 3D CNNs. Just you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I mentioned um, an opportunity to improve this mean shift algorithm, um, and the opportunity for improvement, when you think about it, is pretty obvious. Um, the actual amount of data is huge, right? You've got data points all over the place. Right? Um, the ones that are a long way away, like the weight is going to be so close to zero that we may as well just ignore them. Um, so. The question is, how do we quickly find the ones which are a long way away? Um, and uh, we know the answer to that. Um, we learned it. It's approximate nearest neighbors. Okay? So what if we added an extra step here, which rather than using um, x to get the distance to every data point, we instead using approx used approximate nearest neighbors to grab, you know, 
the closest ones, the only you know the ones that actually are going to matter. So that would basically um, turn this uh, linear time piece into a logarithmic time piece, um, uh, which would be pretty fantastic. So we uh, learned very briefly about a particular approach, which is locality-sensitive hashing. I think I mentioned also there's another approach which I'm really fond of called spill trees. Um, I really, really want us as a team to take this algorithm and add approximate nearest neighbors to it and release it to the community as you know um, the first ever super fast GPU accelerated approximate neural net uh, nearest neighbor accelerated um, in shift clustering algorithm. I think that'd be a really big deal. So um, if anybody's interested. Um, in doing that, I believe you're going to have to implement uh, something like LSH or spill trees um, in PyTorch. Um, and once you've done that, it should be totally trivial to add the step that, that then uses that here. So if you do that, um, then you know if you're interested, I would invite um, you to um, team up with me and that we would then release this piece of software together and um, author a, a paper or a post together. Um, so that's my hope, is that one of you, uh, or a group of you, will make that happen. Um, that would be super exciting, because I think this would be great. Um, you know, like, a, we'd be showing people something pretty cool about the idea of writing GPU algorithms um, today. You know, uh, the, in fact, I found uh, just during the break, here's a whole paper about how to write k-means with CUDA. Um, it's you know, it used to be so much work, um, and this is without even including any kind of approximate nearest neighbors piece or whatever. Um, so I think this would be great. So hopefully that will happen. Okay, um, and look, it gives the right answer. How about that? Um, I guess to do it properly, we should also be replacing the um, Gaussian kernel bandwidth with something that we figure out uh, dynamically um, rather than have it hard coded. Um, all right, so big change. Um, we're going to learn about chatbots. Um, so we're going to start here with Slate. Facebook thinks it has found the secret to making bots less dumb. Um, okay, so this talks about a um, new thing called memory networks, which was demonstrated by Facebook. You can feed it. Sentences that convey key plot points in Lord of the Rings and then ask it various questions. Uh, published a new paper on archive that generalizes the approach. Um, there was another long article about this on Popular Science in which they described it as early progress towards a truly intelligent AI. Um, Jan LeCun is excited about working on a memory network, um, giving the ability to retain information. You can tell the network a story and have it answer questions. And so it even has this little um, GIF. Um, yes, Rachel. Okay, so uh, in the um, article, they've got this little um, example showing um, reading a story of Lord of the Rings and then asking various questions about Lord of the Rings, and it all looks pretty impressive. So we're going to implement this paper. Um, and the paper is called End-to-End um, -end Memory Networks. Um, the uh, paper was actually not shown on Lord of the Rings, um, but was uh, actually shown on something called um, Babby. I don't know, Babby or Baby. I'm never quite sure which one it is. Um, it was a, it's a paper describing a synthetic data set uh, towards AI complete question answering, a set of prerequisite toy tasks. I saw a cute tweet last week uh, with just kind of explaining the meaning of various different uh, types of titles of papers, and uh, it's basically saying towards means we've actually made no progress whatsoever. Um, so we'll take this with a grain of salt. Um, uh, so these introduce the Bubby tasks, and the Bubby tasks um, are probably best described by showing an example. Um, okay, here's an example. So uh, each task is basically a, um, a story 
Uh, a story contains a list of sentences. A sentence contains a list of words. Um, at the end of the story is a query to which there is an answer. So the sentences are ordered in time. So where is Daniel? We would have to go backwards. This says where John is. This is where Daniel is. Daniel journey to the bathroom. Okay, so Daniel is in the bathroom. Okay, so this is what the baby tasks look like. Um, there's a number of um, kind of different structures. This is um, called a one supporting fact structure, which is to say you only have to go back and find one sentence in the story to figure out the answer. Um, we're also going to look at two supporting fact stories, which is ones where you're going to have to look um, uh, twice. Um, so the uh, reading in uh, these data sets um, is uh, not remotely interesting. Um, they're just a text file, we can parse them out. Um, there's various different text files for the various different tasks, um, and if you're interested in the various different tasks you can check out the paper. Um, we're going to be looking at single supporting fact and two supporting fact. They have some with 10,000 examples and some with 1,000 examples. Uh, and the, the goal is to be able to solve every one of their challenges with just a thousand examples. Um, and this paper is not successful at that goal, but it makes um, some movement towards it. Um, so uh, basically we're going to put that into a bunch of different lists um, of a list of stories um, along with their queries. Um, and we can start off by having a look at some um, statistics about them. Um, so the first is, for each story, what's the maximum number of sentences in a story? And the answer is 10. So Lord of the Rings it ain't. Um, and in fact, if you go back and you look at the GIF, when it says read story, Lord of the Rings, that's the whole Lord of the Rings. Okay. Um, Frodo journey to Mount Doom. Frodo dropped the ring there. Great. Um, the total number of different words in this thing is 32. Um, the maximum length of any sentence in a story is 8. The maximum number of words in any query is 4. So, okay, we're immediately thinking, what the hell, right? Because this was presented by the press as being the secret to making bots less dumb and showed us that they took a story and summarized Lord of the Rings with major plot points and asked various questions. Um, and clearly that's not entirely true. Like what they did, like if you look at even the stories, the first word is always somebody's name. The second word here is always um, some synonym for move. Um, there's then a bunch of prepositions, and then the last word is always place. Um, so like these toy tasks are very, very, very toy. So immediately we're kind of thinking maybe this is not a step to uh, making bots less dumb or um, whatever they said here, a truly intelligent AI. Um, Maybe it's towards a truly intelligent AI. <laughs> um, okay, so to get this into Keras, um, we need to turn it into a, um, a, a tensor in which everything is the same size. Um, so we use um, pad sequences for that, like we did um, in the last part of the course, um, which will add zeros uh, to make sure that everything's the same size. Um, so uh, the other thing we'll do is we will uh, create a dictionary um, from words to integers to turn every word into an index. Um, so we're going to turn every word into an index and then pad them um, so that they're all the same length. Um, and then that's going to give us uh, inputs train, 10,000 stories, each one of 10 sentences, um, each one of 8 words. Right? Now, anything that's not 10 sentences long is going to get sentences of just zeros. Any sentence that's not uh, eight words long, we'll get some zeros appended to that. And ditto for the test, uh, except we just got a thousand. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, not surprisingly, we're going to use embeddings. Um, now, 
we have to, we've never done this before, we have to turn a sentence into an embedding, not just a word into an embedding. So there's lots of interesting ways of turning a sentence into an embedding, but when you're just doing towards intelligent AI, you don't do any of them, you instead just add the embeddings up. And that's what happened in this paper. Right? And if you look at like the way it was set up, you can see why you can just add the embeddings up. Um, Mary, John, and Sandra, like they only ever appear in one place. They're always the object of this. You know, the verb is always the same thing. The prepositions are always meaningless, and the last word is always place. Right? So, you know, to figure out what a whole sentence says, you can just add up the word concepts. The order of them doesn't make any difference. There's no knots. There's nothing that makes language remotely complicated or interesting. So, what we're going to do is we're going to create an input for our stories with the number of sentences and the length of each one. Um, we're going to take each word and put it through an embedding. So that's what Time Distributed is doing here, right? It's putting each word through a separate embedding, and then we do a lambda layer to add them up. Okay, so here is our very sophisticated approach to creating sentence embeddings. Um, so we do that for our story. Um, so we end up with something which, rather than being 10 by 8, i.e. 10 sentences by 8 words, it's now 10 by 20, that is 10 sentences by a length 20 embedding. Right? So each one of our 10 sentences has been turned into a length 20 embedding. And we're just starting with a random embedding. We're not going to use word to vec or anything because there's nothing, we don't need the complexity of that vocabulary model. Um, we're going to do exactly the same thing for the query. Okay, we don't need to use time distributed this time. Um, uh, we can just uh, take the query um, because this time we have um, just one query, uh, so we can do the embedding, um, sum it up, and then we use reshape to add a unit axis to the front so that it's now the same um, basic rank, right? We now have one question of embedded to length 20. Okay, so we have 10 sentences in the story and one query. Okay, so what is the memory network, or more specifically the more advanced end-to-end -end memory network? Um, and the answer is, it is this. Okay, as per usual, when you get down to it, it's less than a page of code to do these things. Um, let's draw this before we look at the code. Okay, so we have um, a bunch of sentences. Okay, let's just use four sentences for now. Okay. Um, so each sentence contained a bunch of words, right? and we took each word and we turned them into an embedding, okay. and then we summed all of those embeddings up to get an embedding for that sentence. Right. So each sentence is turned into an embedding, and they were of length 20, what it's worth. Um, okay, uh, and then we took the query. First of all, that, put that here. So these are, this is my story. Here's my query. Same kind of idea. A bunch of words, which we got embeddings for, and we added them up to get an embedding for our question. Okay, so to do a memory network, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these um, embeddings, and we're going to combine it, each one, with a question or a query. And we're just going to take a dot product. Okay, so that's the best way to draw this. Product, 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 
Okay, so we're going to end up with four dot products from each sentence of the story times the query. Right? So like, what does the dot product do? It basically says how similar two things are. When one thing's big, if the other thing's big, if one thing's small, the other thing's small, those things both make the dot product bigger. Okay. So these basically are going to be four vectors describing how similar are each of our four sentences um, to the query. Okay, so that's step one. Um, step two is to stick them through a softmax. Okay. Now, four come again, right? So remember, the dot product just returns a scalar, right? So we now have four scalars, and they add up to one. Okay. Um, and they each are um, uh, basically related to how similar is the query to each of the four sentences. Okay, we're now going to create a totally separate embedding of each of the sentences in our, in our story by creating a totally separate uh, embedding for each word. So we're basically just going to create a um, new random embedding matrix for each word to start with, um, sum them all together, and that's going to give us a new embedding, this one they call C, I believe. Um, and all we're going to do is we're going to multiply each one of these, number them, Each one of these embeddings, we're going to multiply by the um, equivalent softmax as a weighting, and then just add them all together. Right? So we're just going to have uh, these are called S one two three four. It's going to be C one times S one plus C two times S two, and then divided by S. Actually, you don't need to divide by because they add to one. That's it. Okay. So that's going to be um, our final um, result, which is going to be of length uh, 20. Okay. So this thing is a vector of length 20. Um, and then we're going to take that and we're going to put, put it through a single dense layer. And we're going to get back uh, the answer. And that whole thing is the memory network. Um, it's um, incredibly simple. You know, there's no, there's nothing deep in terms of deep learning. There's uh, almost no nonlinearities. Um, so you know, it doesn't seem like it's likely to be able to do very much. Um, but I guess we haven't given it very much to do. Um, so let's take a look at the the code version. Yes. It's for um, so in that last step, you said the answer was that really like the embedding of the answer, and then it has to get the reverse lookup. It's the, yeah, it's the softmax of the answer, and then you have to do an argmax. Okay. Um, so here it is, right? We've got um, we've got the story times the query, uh, the embedding of the story times the embedding of the query, the dot product, right? Um, we do a softmax. Um, softmax works in the last dimension, so I just have to reshape to get rid of the unit axis, and then I reshape again to put the unit axis back on again. Right? But you know the reshapes aren't doing anything interesting, so it's just a dot product followed by softmax, right? and that gives us the weights. So now we're going to take each weight and multiply it by the um, second set of embeddings. Here's our second set of embeddings, embedding C. Um, and in order to do this, um, uh, I just used the dot product again. Um, but because of the fact that you've got a unit axis there, this is actually just doing a, um, a very simple um, weighted average. Um, and again, um, reshape to get rid of the unit axis so that we can stick it through a dense layer with a softmax. Um, and that gives us our final result. So, what this is effectively doing 
is it's basically saying, okay, how similar is the query to each one of the sentences in the story? Use that to create a bunch of weights, and then these things here are basically the answers, right? This is like, if, if story number one was where the answer was, then we're going to use this one in story number two, three, and four, right? Because there's a single, you know, single linear layer at the very end, so it doesn't really get to do much computation. So these, it basically has to learn what the answer represented by each story is. And again, this is lucky because the um, original. Um, from the original data set, the answer to every question is the last word of the sentence. Right? Where is Frodo's ring? Um, or whatever. Right? So that's why we just can have this incredibly simple um, final piece. Um, so we've, you know, this is an interesting use of Keras, right? Um, we've, we've created a, a model which is in no possible way deep learning, right? But it's, you know, a bunch of tensors and layers that are stuck together, and so it has some inputs, it has an output, so we can call it a model, and we can compile it with an optimizer and a loss, right? And then we can fit it. So it's kind of interesting how you can use Keras for things which, you know, uh, don't really use any of the normal layers in any normal way. Um, and as you can see, it works. Right? For what it's worth, okay, we solved this problem, and the particular problem we solved here is the one supporting that problem. Um, and in fact, it worked in less than one epoch. More interesting is um, two supporting facts. Actually, before I do that, I'll just point out something interesting, which is um, we could create another model now that this is already trained, which is to return not the final answer but the value of the the weights. Right? And so we can now go back and say, okay, for a particular story, what are the weights? Um, so let's do f.predict rather than answer.predict. So for this story, where is Sandra? Daniel, Mary, Sandra. Sandra went to the bathroom. Where is Sandra? Bathroom. Right? So for this particular story, um, the weights are here. Right? And you can see that the weight for sentence number two is 0 0.98. Right? So we can actually look inside the, the model and find out you know, what, what sentences is it using to answer this question. We have a question. Would it not make more sense to concat the embeddings rather than sum them? Um, not for this particular problem because because of the way the vocabulary is structured when the sentences are structured. Also have to deal, you would also have to deal with the variable length. Yeah, of the well, of the, we've, we've used padding to make them the same length. So, um, Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to use this in real life, you would need to come up with a better sentence embedding, um, which presumably might be an R&M um, or something like that, because you need to deal with things like not, and the location of subject and object and so forth. One thing to point out is that the order of the sentences matters, and so what I actually did was when I pre-processed it was I added a zero colon, one colon, whatever, to the start of each sentence, right? so that it would actually be able to learn the time order of sentences. So this is like another token that I added. Um, so in case you're wondering what that was, that was something that I added in the pre-processing. Okay, so one nice thing with memory networks is we can kind of look and see if they're not working, in particular why are they not working. Um, okay, so multi-hop. So let's now look at an example of a two supporting facts story. Um, it's mildly more interesting. We still only have one type of verb with various synonyms and a small number of subjects and a small number of objects. Um, so it's basically the same. Um, but now, to answer a question, we have to go down through two hops. So where is the milk? Okay, let's find the milk. Daniel left the milk there. Okay, where is Daniel? Daniel traveled to the hallway. Okay, where is the milk hallway? All right. So that's what we have to be able to do this time. Um, 
And so what we're going to do is exactly the same thing as we did before. Um, but we're going to take our whole little um, our whole little model, right? So do the embedding, reshape dot, reshape softmax, reshape dot, reshape. Um, what's H? Oh, uh, dense layer. Um, uh, sum, um, and we're going to call this one hop. So this whole picture is going to become one hop. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take this and go back and replace the query with our new um, output. Right? So at each step, uh, each hop, we're going to replace the query with, our, with the result of our memory network. And so that way the memory network can learn to recognize that, okay, the first thing I need is the milk, search back, find milk. Okay, I now have the milk, now you need to update the query to where is Daniel. Okay, now go back, find Daniel. Right. So the memory network in multi-hop mode basically does this whole thing again and again and again, replacing the query each time. Right? So that's why I just took the whole set of steps and chucked it into a single function. And so then I just go, okay, response comma story is one hop, response comma story is one hop on that, and you can keep repeating that again and again and again. And then at the end, um, get our output. Um, that's our model. Compile. Fit. I had real trouble getting this to um, fit nicely. I had to play around a lot with learning rates and batch sizes and whatever else. But I did eventually get it up to 0.999 um, accuracy. Um, so this is kind of an unusual class for me to be teaching because like particularly compared to part one where it was like best practices, you know, clearly this is anything but, right? I'm kind of showing you something which was like maybe the most popular request was like teach us about chatbots, right? Um, but let's be honest, who, who has ever used a chatbot that's not terrible? And the reason no one's used a chatbot that's not terrible is that the current state of the art is terrible. Um, so chatbots um, have their place, and indeed um, one of the students in class has written a really interesting kind of analysis of, of this, which hopefully she'll share on the forum. Um, but that place is really um, kind of lots of heuristics and you know carefully set up vocabularies and um, selecting from small sets of answers and so forth. It's not kind of general purpose. Here's a story. Ask anything you like about it. You know, here are some answers. Um, it's not to say we won't get there. Um, I sure hope we will. Um, but the kind of incredible hype we had around neural Turing machines and memory networks and then end-to-end -end memory networks is kind of, um, as you can see, when you actually, even when you just look at the data set, what they worked on, it's kind of crazy. Um, so that is not quite. Um, the um, final conclusion of this though, because um, yesterday um, a paper came out um, which showed uh, how to identify buffer overruns in computer source code using memory networks. And so it kind of spoiled my whole narrative uh, that somebody seems to have um, actually used this technology for something um, effectively. And I guess when you think about it, it, it makes some sense, right? So in case you don't know what a buffer overrun is, that's like if you're writing in a, a, an unsafe language, properly C, uh, you um, allocate some memory that's going to store some result or some input, and you try to put into that memory something bigger than the amount that you allocated, it basically spills out the end. Right? And in the best case, um, it crashes. Um, in the worst case, somebody figures out how to get exactly the right code to spill out into exactly the right place and ends up taking over your machine. 
Um, so buffer overruns are horrible things. Um, and the idea of being able to find them, it, I can actually see it does look a lot like this memory network. You kind of have to see like, oh, where was that variable um, kind of set, and then where was the thing that was set from set, and where was the original thing allocated, um, and it's kind of like just going back through the source code. Um, and the vocabulary is pretty straightforward, you know, it's just the variables that have been defined. Um, so you know, that's kind of interesting. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to really study the paper yet. Uh, but um, you know, it's no chatbot, um, but maybe there is a room for um, memory networks uh, already after all. Is there a way to visualize what the neural network has learned for the text? Um, there is no neural network. Uh, <laughs> um, if you mean the embeddings, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can look at the embeddings easily enough. I mean, the, the, the whole thing is so simple, it's very easy to look at every embedding, and the, as I mentioned, we looked at visualizing the uh, the weights you know, that came out of the softmax, um, but I mean, we, we don't even need to look at it in order to figure out what it learned, right? Like based on the fact that this is just a, num a small number of simple linear steps, um, we know that it basically has to learn what the um, what each sentence answer can be. You know, so sentence number three, its answer will always be milk, and sentence number four, its answer will always be four-way or whatever. Um, and then um, uh, the so that's what the C embeddings are going to have to be, and then the the embeddings of the weights are going to have to basically learn how to come up with a um, what's going to be probably a similar embedding to the query. In fact, I think you can even make them the same embedding, um, so that these dot products basically give you something that gives you similarity scores. Um, so this is really a very simple, largely linear model. So it doesn't require too much visualizing. Um, so having said all that, um, none of this is to say that memory networks um, are useless, right? I mean, they were created by very smart people with an impressive pedigree in deep learning. Um, it's just that this is very early, right? And this tends to happen in um, you know popular press. Um, uh, they kind of get overexcited about things. Although in this case, I don't think we can blame the press. I think we have to blame Facebook for creating a ridiculous demo like this. I mean, this is clearly created to give people the wrong idea, which I find very surprising from people like Jan McCohen, who normally do the opposite of that kind of thing. Um, uh, so not, this is not really the press's fault in this case. Um, um, but this may well turn out to be a critical component um, in Bots and Q&A systems and whatever else, um, but uh, we're not there yet. Um, I had a good chat to um, um, uh, Stephen Merity the other day, who's a researcher I respect a lot and also somebody I like, uh, who um, I asked him what he thought was kind of the most exciting uh, research in this direction at the moment, and he mentioned something that I was also very excited about, which is called recurrent entity networks. And the recurrent entity network paper is the first to solve all of the all of the Babby tasks um, with 100% accuracy. Um, now, you know, take of that what you will. Um, I don't know how much that means. There's synthetic tasks. One of the things that Stephen Merity actually pointed out in the blog post is that they are. You know, even the basic kind of coding of how they're created is pretty bad. They have like lots of replicas, and it's like the whole thing's a bit of a mess. But anyway, um, nonetheless, this is a, a an interesting um, approach. So if you're interested in memory networks, um, you know, this is certainly something you can look at. And I do think this is, um, yeah, you know, it's likely to be an important direction. Having said all that, one of the key reasons I wanted to look at um, these memory networks is not only because it was the largest request, I think, from the forums for this part of the course, but also because it introduces um, something that's going to be critical for the next couple of lessons, which is the concept of attention. Um, attention um, or attentional models are models where um, we have to do exactly what we just looked at, which is basically find out at each time, you know, which 
um, part you know, of a story to look at next, or which part of an image to look at next, or which part of a sentence to look at next. Um, and so our, the task that we're going to be trying to get, uh, get at um, over the next lesson or two is going to be to translate French into English. Okay, so this is clearly not a toy task. Right? This is a, a very challenging task. Um, and one of the challenges is that in a particular French sentence, sentence which has got some bunch of words, it's likely to turn into an English sentence with some different bunch of words, and maybe these particular words here might be this translation here, and this one might be this one, and this one might be this one. And so as you go through, you need some way of saying like, oh, which word do I look at next? Right? So that's going to be the um, attentional model. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be um, trying to come up with um, a, a proper RNN, you know, proper RNN like an LSTM or a GRU or whatever, where we're going to change it so that inside the um, RNN um, it's going to actually have some way of figuring out um, which part of the input um, to look at next. So that's the basic uh, idea of attentional models. And so interestingly, during this time that memory networks and neural Turing machines and stuff were getting all this um, uh, huge amount of press attention, um, very quietly in the background at exactly the same time, um, attentional models um, were appearing as well. Um, and it's the uh, attentional models for language that have really turned out to be critical. Um, so you've probably seen uh, all of the um, press about Google's new neural translation system, and that really is everything that it's claimed to be. Like it, it really is basically one giant neural network that can translate any pair of languages. Uh, the accuracy of those translations is far beyond anything that's happened before. And the basic um, structure of that neural net is, um, as we're going to learn, is you know, not that different to what we've already learned. Um, it's just going to have this one extra step, which is um, attention. And kind of depending on you know, how interested you guys are in the details of this neural translation system, it turns out that there are also lots of little tweaks. You know, the tweaks are kind of around like, um, okay, you've got a really big vocabulary, some of the words appear very rarely, um, you know, how do you build a system that can understand how to translate those really rare words, for example. Um, and also just kind of things like how do you deal with the memory issues around having huge embedding matrices of like 160,000 words um, and stuff like that. So there's like lots of details and the nice thing is that because, uh, I guess particularly because Google has ended up putting this thing in production, um, all of these little details kind of have answers now and those answers are all really interesting. Um, there aren't really um, on the whole great examples of kind of all of those things put together. Um, so, you know, one of the things interesting here will be that you'll have opportunities to kind of do that. Um, generally speaking, the blog posts about these kind of neural translation systems tend to be kind of at a pretty high level. They describe like roughly how these kind of approaches work, but uh, Google's complete neural translation system is not out there. You know, you can't download it and see the code. Um, so, you know, we'll see how we go. Um, but we'll kind of do it um, uh, piece by piece. Um, here. So yeah, I guess one other thing to mention about the memory network um, is that Keras actually comes with a end-to-end um, -end memory network example um, in the in the Keras GitHub. Um, which, weirdly enough, when I actually looked at it, it turns out doesn't implement this at all. Um, and so even on the single supporting fact thing, it takes many, many generations and doesn't get to 100% accuracy. Um, and I found this quite surprising to discover that 
you know, once you start getting to some of these more recent advances or kind of non, you know, not, not just a standard CNN or whatever, it's just less and less common that you actually find code that's correct and that works. Uh, and so this uh, memory network example was one of them. So if you actually go into the Keras uh, GitHub and look at examples and go and have a look and download the memory network, you'll find that you don't get um, results anything like this. And if you look at the code, you'll see that it doesn't, it really doesn't do this at all. Um, so I just kind of wanted to mention that as a bit of a warning that um, you're kind of at the point now where you might want to take with a grain of salt blog posts you read, like, uh, or even some papers that you read, um, well worth experimenting with them and assuming, you know, you should start with the assumption that you can do it better. And uh, maybe even start with the assumption that you can't necessarily trust uh, all of the conclusions that you've read, um, because the vast majority of the time, um, in my experience of putting together this part of the course, the vast majority of the time, um, the stuff out there is just wrong. Uh, even in cases like in the, you know, I deeply respect the Keras authors and the Keras source code, but even in that case, this is just wrong. So I think that's an important, uh, uh, important point to be aware of. Okay, um, I think we're done. So I think we're going to finish five minutes early for a change. I think that's never happened before. Um, so thanks everybody. Uh, and so this week, um, yeah, hopefully we can uh, have a look at the Data Science Bowl, Make a Million Dollars, uh, Create a New PyTorch Approximate Nearest Neighbors uh, Algorithm, and then when you're done, maybe uh, figure out the next stage for uh, memory networks. Okay, thanks everybody.